Well, friends, it's hard to believe it's been this many weeks since we have gathered together. It's still heartbreaking to me, and at the same time, I am so grateful to God that he allows us to have this. I do want us to remember, always to be remembering, that this is not the same. This is not a substitute for gathering together. As I mentioned uh, more than once before, this is much like FaceTiming with, with family members, maybe with grandchildren. It's, it's great when you can do that, when you can see their little faces smiling at you, and you can talk back and they can see you as well. It's, it's a great thing to be able to do that, but it's not the same as picking up your little grandbaby and holding them, is it? So this is great that we can do this, and I am so glad that we can do it, but it is not the same as gathering together, hearing God's word proclaimed and learning together from him. It is not the same as us singing together, as, as Ephesians 5.19 calls us to address one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. It's not the same as collectively praying and having the Holy Spirit move among us so that when we hear his word proclaimed, we hear it as a body. It's not the same as gathering together at the Lord's table. And we should miss that. We should ache for that. We should yearn for that. We should mourn the fact that we've missed it all these weeks and we'll never get those weeks back again. And at the same time, give glory to God for his purposes in this. God works all things together for good. And he's working this together for our good. So we should be seeking, and I want to encourage you to be seeking gospel opportunities in the midst of this. I have been really compelled over and over again to read from the second letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Coming out of the day when we, we celebrated Good Friday and, and <clears throat> the Resurrection Day, it says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. For God the Father <clears throat> made God the Son to actually be sin. He, he became sin who had never sinned, who did not know what it was like to commit sin, to have a sinful thought or a sinful deed or a sinful word from his mouth. But God made him, God the Father made God the Son, sin who knew no sin so that in him, in Christ, you and I become the righteousness of God. We actually become his righteousness, right? So that's what we're celebrating on Resurrection Day. But I want to go back one verse before that. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And so, friends, during this time, during this, this global pandemic, during this health crisis, during this time of self-isolation, uh, when we're not going to work, or if we're going to work, we're in way different circumstances than we typically are. Um, either um, healthcare workers who, who have more stuff going on and more people around, or maybe you work in an office or somewhere else where you're kind of isolated there, not going to school. And yet, God commands us to be His witnesses. And we need to be imploring people right now, right now, we need to be imploring people to reconcile themselves with God. Let's go to the word of the Lord for, from the ninth psalm. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all your wonderful deeds. That's part of what happens when we're imploring people to reconcile themselves. We, we recount all the wonderful things God has done for us. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing Praise to your name, O Most High. The Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for justice. And he judges the world with righteousness. He judges the people with uprightness. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed. 
a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord who sits enthroned in Zion. Tell among the people his deeds.
Hey guys, I'm going to read you another story from our book, Everyone a Child Should Know, written by Claire Heath White and Jenny Brake drew all the pictures. I'm going to read a story. Remember, these are biographies. They are true stories about real life people. And this person has a very, very interesting name. His first name was Adoniram. Adoniram Judson is his name. And this is a picture of kind of what he looked like. It starts with a Bible verse. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. And that's Psalm 22, verse 27. Adoniram Judson was born in 1788 and died in 1850. Who first told you about Jesus? Your parents? Your friend? Someone at church or school? Adoniram Judson didn't become Jesus' friend until he was a grown-up, but he had always known about Jesus from his parents, from church, and from school. But Adoniram knew that some people in the world would never hear about Jesus from their parents, from church, or from school. He knew that there were places in the world where almost nobody had heard about Jesus at all. Places like Burma. No one from America had ever gone overseas to tell people about Jesus before, but Adoniram decided to go. Burma was very different from America. The people spoke a different language, so Adoniram learned it. The people wore different clothes, so Adoniram wore them. No one knew about Jesus, so Adoniram told them. He told lots and lots of Burmese people but nobody wanted to be Jesus' friend. He told more and more Burmese people. Finally, after six whole years of telling Burmese people about Jesus, one Burmese man became Jesus' friend. Adoniram kept going. He put the Bible into the Burmese language so more people could find out about Jesus. He was ill. He was put in prison. His wife died. His children died. But Adoniram kept going. By the time Adoniram died, thousands of Burmese people had become Jesus' friend. And I would tell you, ask your mom and dad to look him up on the internet. Because nearly every Christian in that part of the world today somehow gets traced back to Adoniram Judson and that first Burmese man who became Jesus' friend. Nearly every Baptist church, at least in that part of the world, can trace its roots back to the church that Adoniram Judson started in Burma. God can do great things through people who are willing to go and do what he says. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this chance to talk to these children this way. But oh, how I miss them. And Lord, I ask that you would make the time short until we're back together again. And Lord, I would ask that these children would begin to think right now, even today, about what you want them to do. And wherever it would be, whether it's around the world or around the block, that they would go and tell people to be Jesus' friends. First, that they would be Jesus' friend, and then that they would tell people, wherever you send them, to be Jesus' friend too. And in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Bye, guys. I love you, and I really miss you.
So we are going to return today to one of the seven I am statements in the gospel according to John. And these are statements where Jesus was proclaiming something about himself to give us understanding who he is. And he must say a number of different things, for we cannot understand the, the totality of Christ, the totality of God. We, we cannot completely grasp that. So he gives us pieces so that we may see and understand. And as we've said before, when he said, I am, in these areas, it's not the same as when he was saying, I am going this place or uh, I am going to that place. He's saying, I am, as God spoke to Moses out of the burning bush. And Moses said, who shall I say has sent me? And God said, tell them, I am has sent you. I am that I am. God proclaiming himself to be above and beyond all, outside of time and space. His existence is in and of himself. I am. And Jesus is saying, I am. And I want to pick up on another little word, one little article, T-H-E. When Jesus makes these proclamations, he is also making a, a unique and exclusive proclamation. When he says, I am the bread of life, and I am the light of the world, and I am the resurrection, it's I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection, not a, the, the only one, the only one. So as we hear today, that's very important for us to remember that Jesus is not just the door. He's the door, not just a door, the door. So if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, turn to John 10. Lord willing, we'll be looking at this passage this week and next as two of these great I am statements are found here. Gracious God, as we look into your word, may we remember that it is a living and active word. It is the word of the living and active God, alive and active and sovereign even now especially now when the world is is being held under as it would seem by the by a little virus may we understand that it is not what uh, can be found under a microscope that rules the world it is the one on the throne of heaven holy spirit teach us in jesus name Amen. John 10, verse 1. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and call his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. And I'm going to pause right there because Jesus is going to shift his metaphor here, but we want to understand what he is saying here. Sheep were all often kept together, many sheep in a large fold, and many shepherds would have their sheep in together. But when a shepherd came and called his sheep, they knew his voice, and his sheep would come out and follow him. The other sheep would not. So Jesus is talking about some things here, about a, a, a fake shepherd and a robber and those things, and now he's going to shift his metaphor slightly because they did not understand what he was saying. So picking up at verse 7. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. He will go in and out and find pasture. 
The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me. And I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I'm going to stop there in that last part. Again, Lord willing, we will look at next week, but for context, we needed to hear that. So two I am statements here, and I am the good shepherd is the one, again, that is planned for next week. Today we want to look at Jesus saying, I am the door. The door. That's just so important here. The I am is greatly important also. It's Jesus saying, this is what I am. This is me for you. But the T-H-E in there, the V, makes it exclusive. So many people over, over time have said, well, there are many paths, many roads leading to the same destination. Many ways to God. And Jesus is saying, I am the door. Not a door. So you don't get, you know, let's make a deal, right? You don't get door number one, door number two, door number three, and all of them leading to a big prize, right? No. The other doors lead to hell and destruction. This is the door that leads to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. So, the sheep were, were kept in a pen, right? They were, they were kept in, in, in a pen with all the sheep together. And that would kind of represent the world, right? Where all people are together. And then the shepherd would come and call his sheep. Okay? And, and the sheep that entered through that gate, that door, and, and, and door and gate could be uh, exchanged here. I think depending on the version of the Bible you're looking at, you may see gate instead of door. Same it's the same concept. It's the thing that's keeping you from passing and then opening. It is an opening that allows you to go. And if you want to find good pastures, if you want to go where the good shepherd leads, if you want to be able to, to correctly and accurately and lovingly quote the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Right? So that's Jesus the shepherd. But the way to that is Jesus the door, Jesus the gate. And he is the only way. He's exclusive. And what we're talking about, the reason that, that I chose these seven statements to, to talk about Jesus is to for us to spend these weeks that we're we're isolated from one another to be so focused on Christ we want to be staring at Jesus and learning all about him we can because the way to overcome a, a fear and anxiety and stress and grief is by focusing on the one who offers peace and comfort and love and strength in, in addition to this pandemic, there's all sorts of other junk going on, right? So people are being sick, yes, and, and the, the economy is, is doing all these crazy things, yes. And then we get to the, if you turn on the news, you look at the newspaper, the politicians are just like this. It's craziness everywhere. I want us to look at the, at the place where peace can be found. And it's not a falsehood peace. It's not just a panacea to make you feel better. It's not a placebo, something to take to, to just think you're feeling better. This is the actual, real peace. So we want to spend this time together, however many weeks, 
God would give us doing things this way as opposed to gathering together. And again, I'm praying this is a short time, but God is in charge. So I want us to spend this time just holding on to who Christ is. And we're going to look at these things the way he gives them to us. So the bread of life to, to eat and to be strengthened, to live, right? The light of the world, the way that we see and also the way other people see him as he's reflected off of us. Uh, the resurrection and the life, the, the way that we will live on into eternity and the door, the way we get there. The passage that we go through to get there is through Christ. And it is an exclusive claim. There are such things as truths. There are truths that are exclusive. And in a world where that seems to be a very unpopular thought, it doesn't rely on popularity to be true. Right? There are exclusive truths. You must breathe oxygen. If you're deprived of oxygen, you will die. You must drink water. If you don't drink water, you will die. Men and women must come together to produce children. If we don't do that, there won't be children. There are exclusive truths. And this is an exclusive truth. There is no way to heaven except through Christ, the door. You know a story of someone going into the ministry, and part of the denominational process was to have a psychological evaluation done and to do a, a battery of these um, personality tests and those kind of things. And so, this true story, uh, they sent to the regional person that, that took care of this, and they did the battery of tests, and he went home, and then some weeks later, the results were ready, and he went back for the results of the test, and it took quite a time. There were hours of test taking. It was going to take quite a while to, to, um, to give the results. And so the psychiatrist's office was in his home in a, in a, in a bedroom. The office was set up in what had, would be a bedroom in a typical home, and and they were going through, and he started out, the psychiatrist starting out, started out the interview by saying, you did very well, I think that you know, you're going to be accepted, at least based on these things. Um, so the only thing is, you seem to be very single-minded, very close-minded when it comes to matters of religion, which surprised the man, because that's exactly what he would expect one would want in areas of your faith, right? To be closed-minded to the, to the truth. Like, we want um, uh, people that design cars to be thinking about cars and think that, that the cars must have ways that they are made to move and, and they must be steered and, and all those sorts of things. We want uh, doctors to be uh, single-minded when it comes to the, the health of their patients. They want the health of the patients to be the focus of that thing. And we want pastors to be focused on Jesus Christ and the, the gospel and the exclusivity of it. And the man said to the psychiatrist, well, I would expect that to be the case. You know, we, we, we have an exclusive religion. We believe that this is the single way. And the psychiatrist replied, son, just in my experience, rarely is there only one way to anything. Well, they went on through the interview and going through, given the results, and, and they were about halfway through, and the man said, may we take a break? May I use your restroom? And the psychiatrist said, of course you may. Just go out that door and down the hall. It's on the right. To which the ministerial candidate replied, I don't want to go out that door. The psychiatrist said, well, that's the only way. Then he caught himself and said, I see what you're doing. To which the person responded with the gospel. Yes, sometimes there is only one way. And Jesus says, I am the door. 
I, so Jesus. Okay, let's just break that down. I, Jesus, is saying this. Am. The essence of what I am, this is not all that I am, but part of the essence that I am is this. Part of the essence of who I am, part of the reason that I exist and came here and part of the absolute essence of who I am is this door, this gate for my sheep to go to good pasture. V. It's only me. So it's Jesus saying it and only Jesus can say this with truth and integrity. Only Jesus can say it. And the exclusive, right? So uh, the and, the essence of who he is, is to be the exclusive way. And exclusively, the door. I am the door. So the gateway to which we enter into eternity, eternal life, is through Christ. Through Jesus Christ, his essence made up and part of this, exclusively him, and the way in. And that eternal life begins the moment, we've said this before, the moment that you put your trust in Christ Jesus, the moment that you repent of your sins and you, you hear the Holy Spirit calling you in and, and you respond, he is chosen to save you, and you respond by repenting of your sins from that moment. Friends, if you're... A Christian, if you have done these things, you are already living eternally. As we said last week, there's a time coming to shake off this old and tired and battered body. But it's the body that's falling off and dying. Our souls are living on into eternity, one day to be rejoined with a new and glorified body. But the way to go through is Christ and Christ alone. Alone. Solus Christus from the five solas, right? This is what was reclaimed during the Protestant Reformation, that it's not Jesus plus anything. It's not Jesus plus anything. It's not uh, 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 following Jesus, Jesus saving me plus being baptized. We should be baptized, but the baptism doesn't save us. Jesus is the door. Baptism is not the door. Baptism is something we should do once we have gone through the door. Going to church. It's not Jesus plus the church. We should be part of a church. We are commanded to be part of a church, but that does not save us. Having a Christian family, reading the Bible. None of those things save us. All things that we desire, things that we are commanded to do, we should read our Bibles, we should pray. But we must enter through the door that is Christ Jesus. You know, when Jesus died on the cross and at the same moment the, the veil in the temple was torn in two, that was showing the way to God. See, when the temple was built, the tabernacle before it in the temple, there was this place, the Holy of Holies. It's the place where the Ark of the Covenant sat with the two cherubim on, on each end and the mercy seat between. And that place where the high priest went once a year, once in a lifetime, would go in and where the presence of God would come and meet man. No one else could enter there. That's why when Zechariah was in as the high priest, he was stunned to hear a voice, right? Because the, the angel came to tell him about John the Baptist, who would be his child, right? He was stunned. Never had there been a second voice inside the Holy of Holies. Never before. That's where one had to go. But when the Christ was crucified, that veil tore in two. And it signified all sorts of things. It signified the Holy Spirit coming out into the world. Wherever the Holy Spirit would be, God is meeting man. Jesus, the literal place, right, where the Holy Spirit came upon Mary 
and Jesus, the, the human, was conceived, God meeting man. Now, everywhere, everywhere is the door available. Everywhere is the door available. Uh, Jesus talking to the woman at the well. And she says, I know that you Jews worship over here, and we say we worship over there. And Jesus said, there's a time coming when it won't be over there or over here. Time coming when, when true worship, worshipers will worship in spirit and truth. You see, all of those places that were always meant to point people to Christ came to fulfillment in Christ. All of those people from the Old Testament who were followers of God were, were sort of like, if you can imagine those, those sheep being in, in, in that long lane that's kind of fenced on both sides and it's pointing them to the gate. They were all coming, pointing to the gate. The gate was Jesus. The door was Jesus. The way they got to green pastures was through Jesus Christ, friends. And that's the way you and I must get to Jesus. And then, then, we can feast in those green pastures. And this is great for us to know, and, and I'm trusting that most everyone listening to this has gone through that door, the door who is Christ Jesus. But if you are listening, watching, and you've never done that, then you're not saved. You must repent of your sins and Turn and put your trust in Christ Jesus, and he will save you. And so I would ask, if that's you right now, talk to someone you're there with. If, if there's no one there with you, call a Christian friend, call a pastor, call me. May today be the day of your salvation. And friends, I also want to say this to you to give you some boldness when you're speaking about Christ, when you're sharing the gospel. As I read from 2 Corinthians, right, that we are called to be ambassadors for Christ. We are called to appeal, God making his appeal through us, imploring you, being whoever we're talking to, imploring you to be reconciled with God. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. We are ambassadors for the door. We know the way to the door. We must show people the way to the door. And, and, and if we love someone, put it the other way, you have to hate someone to not point them to the door. I, I'm not prone to using the, the fire escape sort of um, discussion talking about one being saved. But I will say this. If you were trapped on the rooftop or in a room somewhere and there was a fire breaking out and there was only one way out and you knew the one way out and you weren't telling anybody, you would have to hate them. Yeah. There's time to tell. We have time to tell. If we're not telling, we are not loving our neighbors and we're not loving God. We're not loving our neighbor as ourselves because we want to escape. We want to be rescued. And we know the way. We know the door. Jesus is the door. Brothers and sisters, during this time when we are apart from everyone else, I plead with you to find ways. And it may be electronically. You know, maybe, maybe it's an email. Maybe you have to cover some business with an email. Close it out. Hey, I'm missing you while we're apart. I'm praying for you. Maybe it's a, a social media post. And, and I, would, I would implore you with this. Fill your social media. People are looking at it at record numbers. Fill your social media stuff with things that would glorify God. They don't have to be trite Bible verses, like things that are, I mean, no Bible verses trite. They don't have to be just trite sayings. You can say something honest. You can post a simple Bible verse, but open yourself to whoever might see it and say, I'd like to talk to you about this. Would you like to talk about this? There is so much rancor and so much disagreement and so much anxiety flooding social media right now. 
None of that is pointing anybody toward the door. We have the knowledge and the ability and the availability. Brothers and sisters, let's take advantage of that. Go out in your yard. Pull a chair out in the front yard and talk to the neighbors as they're walking by. Just be friendly. And when someone stops, look for the opportunity to tell them about Jesus. Look for the opportunity to tell them that there is a door. It doesn't really matter how friendly you are. Now, there are times when someone, uh, when, when you're placed with someone for a very brief moment in time, and you may need to share the gospel right up front, right away. Then there are people that are in our lives, in our circles, in varying degrees, and we have more time to talk to them, so we may not uh, always bring it home right in the moment. But you've got to bring it home sometime. It doesn't matter how nice and how friendly you are with your neighbors. You hate them if you never tell them about saving life in Christ Jesus. It's hypocritical to know the truth about eternal life. It's hypocritical to say, I love Jesus and I love my neighbors, but I'm not going to tell them about who he is. So friends, I implore you to implore others to reconcile themselves with God. And they do that simply by entering through the door that is Christ Jesus. And when that happens, he will be saved. Listen, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. He will go in and out and find pasture. The way to abundant life here, and by abundant life, I don't mean life necessarily filled with, with riches, with wealth, but life filled with joy and love and hope and freedom from anxiety. That's abundant living, and that's available right now. You enter through Christ, and you find pasture. And I don't know what you've experienced with other people. I don't know what you count as great success in your life, but there is no sweeter feeling. Nothing, nothing, nothing feels like taking someone's hand and leading them to the door that is Christ Jesus.
Well, friends, another week has come and gone, and another one of these uh, times together while apart has come and gone. And I just want to leave you with these closing thoughts about Jesus, the door. Jesus, the door, the way to reconcile with God is through the door. So I'm going back to 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore, we, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Friends, may that be your rallying cry for this week, to go to others and say, I am an, am an ambassador for Christ Jesus, and I implore you to be reconciled with God. Come to the door and go and find green pastures. And brothers and sisters, till we meet again, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you all the health, happiness, wholeness, all that is peace with God. May he give you shalom. Amen.